Hi, this is Jim Peters with Peters, Peters Principles. And as you know, you never know who you're going to get out of Peters Principles. And today we have the distinct honor of having Chief Taylor with us. Chief, thanks for coming by. Thank you for the invitation. The, um, all I hear about the police department now are, are good things. Is, is, is uh, that pretty much the, what's the, how the city's going on? Are, are we, are we uh, living a, a, a fairly decent life? And well, I would say that uh, thank you very much for the compliment and behalf, on behalf of all the men and women that work in the police department that are, you know, I, I certainly agree are doing a tremendous job, the, uh, the officers, the civilians. Uh, I'll accept that and thank you very much. Um, what I can say is that, um, you know, from a police perspective, I think things are going well. Um, we anticipate when I get the final numbers for 2016, uh, we'll see a third consecutive year of crime reduction in the city. Uh, that's really tremendous stuff. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, a testament to the hard work and dedication of all the officers in the police department. But it's more than that, it's, it's our partners. It's uh, a wide range of uh, organizations, public, non-profit, non uh, corporations in the city, and community groups really all working together to try and make Lowell the safest city that we can possibly make it in, in certainly in the area. Okay, there was a situation <coughs> that I was a little concerned about that I read in the paper. Um, a shootout on Gates and yes. Westbury Street? Yes. Um, and in the middle of the afternoon? Very disturbing. Yes. Very, did, did, you, did you find the perpetrators? Or well, we did find one of them. Well, so I wouldn't say the perpetrators, I would say the alleged perpetrators. Yes, exactly. the perpetrators, but. Uh, We did. We made uh, an arrest and seized a firearm that uh, we believe was used in that particular situation. And I think while I can't speak about that particular incident, because obviously people right. have due process rights and uh, the individuals that we've arrested, I, you know, it does highlight a continuing concern uh, that we have in the community, and that's uh, sometimes people get into these altercations. In this particular one, uh, we believe many of the individuals were previously caught involved and had done some periods of incarceration, and uh, they come back to the community as they always do, um, in most cases. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if they come back without uh, taking any steps to reform their behavior. Um, then sometimes they get back into the same old routine and the same old lifestyle, which is not obviously conducive for them or the community at large. So, you know, as a community, we've worked very hard to try and uh, work with our partners in the Sheriff's Department, and, and uh, UTEC is a big partner of ours, to take individuals uh, that potentially had to previously uh, been in trouble with, with the criminal justice system. And, and start working with those individuals. And I know UTEC does a great job with this, and the Sheriff Contusion in Middlesex County really has put a lot of emphasis on this, to try and get them uh, the skill set and some of the help so that when they do come back into the community, uh, they can be better citizens and, and lead a better, more productive life. It appears as though in this particular case that maybe didn't work as well as we would like. You okay. Know, okay. Obviously, well, and that's very detrimental. Let's, uh, very, it seems like a very honest appraisal. So, yeah. Um, the uh, <coughs> Sheriff Katusian is actually supposed to be on the show in a few weeks. So. We're very fortunate to have Sheriff Katusian. He seems like a coming. very uh, um, hardworking person. Very much. Um, I, how many officers do we have in the role now? How many, we, we picked up some, right? Yes. So that's a, and that is another big component of uh, keeping Lowell safe. The City Council and the the uh, Murphy administration. Uh, have been very good to us. They have allowed us to increase our staffing levels up to 250 police officers and a, and a pretty substantial civilian component. Uh, so all told, the, the police department has in the vicinity of 330 employees or so, uh, if you take into consideration the civilian employees, the dispatchers that run the emergency communication center, um, the school crossing guys that come under us, the, the sign shop. So it's a, it's a, it's actually the largest city um, uh, department outside the school department, obviously, which is separate. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and, and uh, your funding is from the city. Yes. As opposed to the school department's f uh, funding is from everywhere, everywhere. Right. Anywhere they can get a grant. It is. We get. We do have the benefit of getting uh, some grant funds, which we have. Another thing that this uh, administration has done 
is we put together a very robust team of um, uh, research and development component uh, that works for me and they do a combined police, fire and emergency management uh, component and they go out and get grants essentially that's a big part of their job and they have been enormously successful both for that's police good. and fire so we do get some funding uh, you know fairly substantial component of it from various grants yeah I uh, know of outfits that, that need grants so I, if, if I could sit, sit down with them I'd sure. appreciate it absolutely uh, the opioid crisis I, that, that, that there, there's a person in town who uh, ran for city council, and, and he was basically all about the opioid crisis, and that that was uh, uh, Jordan Guys. And uh, yes, what is the situation with the opioid crisis in Lowell? Or, or, it seems like the not not as many people are dying of overdoses as were dying of those overdoses a year ago. Well, actually, uh, it's a little bit of a mixed result, but I think we are trending in the right direction. And uh, I will say this at the beginning of this part of the conversation. Without question, I view the opiate crisis and all the related, you know, issues related to it as the public safety and public health crisis of our time. That's right. the issue that, you know, occupies a great deal of everybody's time in law enforcement and public health and treatment services, as it should. Um, in 2015, we uh, saw 46 individuals, 46 members of the Lowell community uh, die from a heroin or fentanyl over overdose, opiate related overdose. That number increased in 2016 to 62. Uh, it will probably go up a little bit after that when we get some more toxicology results right. from the medical examiner. But, you know, 46 and then last year was 62. So, certainly an increase in 2016 over 15. However, <clears throat> what I can say, um, maybe, you know, if we're trying to look for some glimmer of hope here, what I can say is the first six months of 2016 were particularly devastating, right? Mm -hmm. We had 40 fatal overdoses between January 1st and June uh, 30th. Since June 30th of 2016, the pace has slowed. Now, it's still way too many, and if you're a family member, a loved one, or a co-worker, or somebody that you know is one of those statistics, it's worth it, right? right. Uh, but from uh, July 1st of 16 through the end of 16, uh, we had um, 22 additional. So that's a slowing, and, and, and what I can tell you is I just found out for the month of January in 2017, we had one. Only That's one. Good. So that is good. So again, it's still too many. Uh, but what I hope, my hope is, and I and I kind of do believe this, is that you've seen a lot of uh, uh, emphasis, both from the city, the state, and the even the national level, focusing attention on this issue. We right. put it. We've put together the co-op team in the in the police department with the fire and Lowell House and Lowell uh, Health Department. And you've seen similar, um, you know, resources being put into this battle um, at many different levels. It really is a community-wide effort here in Lowell. And so what my hope is, and I do believe that we've hopefully started to turn the corner, and uh, because of this community-wide emphasis on this issue and everybody's dedication and, and efforts, I have hope, my hope is that we're starting to see some positive results. Well, the that's good. Can you, can you describe for me what Narcan is used for? Yeah. So uh, Narcan is a is a chemical. We carry it in the police. Every police cruiser has it. Every police facility has it. All of our officers have been trained. All of the Lowell Fire personnel have been trained. They carry it on all of their apparatus. And then obviously Trinity Ambulance, which is our uh, medical uh, ambulance right. provider in the city and um, other components. We all have access, so it's everywhere now, which is good, and that really has helped decrease the fatal consequences of these op opiate and overdoses. Um, what it does is it essentially short circuits the, the, uh, the negative impact of the, of the opiate. So we will come upon a scene, we'll see somebody that's overdosing, mm -hmm. um, and typically it, it's uh, their pulse and their breathing rate starts to 
uh, go down significantly. In many cases, they were unconscious. And without the benefit of Nakian, uh, they would continue to down that death spiral and, and very likely, you know, succumb to this. The Nakian, almost instantaneously, it works within a few minutes, uh, reverses that. It, it, it serves to block uh, the impact of the opiates. And literally, they come back to life sometimes. I mean, that's the what you actually see. Uh, very quickly, they'll come back to life. Now, the, the complication is um, it's a short-term effect. Right. So they still need to get to a medical facility uh, to get long-term treatment because eventually the Nakia wears off and then they can go back into a, potentially an overdose state. So, okay, the, uh, so it, it saves untold number of lives. It, 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 it's a benefit. Oh my god, yes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. All right, all right, because we, we hear about it, but we don't really know what it does. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to find out. Well, what without, that. you know, and I, and I will say that, you know, we've received grants to train and, and equip everybody in the police department with NACAN, likewise in the fire department. And, um, you know, our, our two unions, the police unions, right. were willing to step up and, and uh, you know, agree to this training and, and the deployment of this very, very quickly. Uh, if we didn't have that, the death toll would be much greater. Terrifying. Yeah, right. Absolutely much greater. Yeah. Okay. Um, the homeless uh, situation, do we still have homeless uh, camps in, along the river and that type of thing? Well, we do. We certainly do. And it's, a, it's an issue, especially this time of year in the cold weather, that we kind of proactively go out, try and find them, get them into some kind of a better condition, you know. Um, many of the, quite, quite candidly, most of the people that are in those homeless camps are there um, at some point because they choose to be. In other words, they, they choose not to avail themselves of the many services that are available uh, to them, whether it's a transitional living center or some other type of... There are some people that can't, but right. a lot of them, for a variety of different reasons, you know, choose that. Don't. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's particularly um, unfortunate because they, you know, this time of year, it's certainly not a you know, position you want to see anybody in, right? So we go out, we out, we outreach to them. We have a big part of our outreach efforts is the co-op team, and it's a combined police officer, firefighter, and a, um, a treatment um, specialist from right. Lowell House. Right. And that's what they do every day. They go out and find individuals in some of these homeless encampments, um, you know, some less than optimal living conditions. Right. And they try and do everything they can to encourage them into treatment, many times there's an addiction involved, right, um, and to get them into a better living situation. So we, we really do put a lot of emphasis on that. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about the shootouts on Westford Street. What I wanted to ask you about sure. was uh, there was a shooting, um, I, I heard anyway from a person who used to live, used to live in the building, on uh, Walker Street. Ten, ten shots fired into an apartment. Yeah, okay, yes, that was about a week ago. About so. a week ago? Yes. Right. Yep. Uh, what, what's happening with Ryan Mom's bill to make this a felony? Is, 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 yeah. is, is, uh, it, uh, from what I understand from Roddy, it, it's passed the House and it's in the Senate. Are, are we making any effort to uh, get well, it passed? Yes, well, the Representative Mom has been a very pro much a proponent of that bill, and uh, the District Attorney, Marion Ryan, also, and many of the you know, state reps around here, they understand how needed this type of legislation is to make the crime, or uh, make the punishment commensurate with the crime. Right. So currently, if somebody fires into a dwelling uh, and they don't hit anybody, we are left with a series of, uh, you know, uh, charges against that individual if we can find them uh, that is, I think, less than optimal. Uh, it's more like goes along the lines of destruction of property. Right, if they don't hit anybody, oh, wow. which is, which is uh, really not appropriate for, no, it, it, not because sure. that many times is an instrument of essentially terror. Right. They're trying to intimidate people, or you know, put them on notice for whatever the you know the reason may be. Um, and so this particular bill elevates the penalties for that. If you shoot into a dwelling, um, and somebody resides there, then it significantly elevates the penalties and it makes it. it, it the important thing is they'd have to do a period of incarceration, uh, which you would uh, I think is yes, that's right, <coughs> which is appropriate, right? Well, I would think that 
there is nothing more frightening than having your home shot into. Absolutely. Um, you, 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 your home is where you feel safe, and, and, right. and this takes away the safety um, right. factor. Right. Um, do, do we have any... <coughs> uh, has Eileen Donahue come out in favor of this, or... or a, yeah, I'm sure she has. I would. I feel confident. I don't remember specifically, but I'm sure that that is would be something that she would be um, supportive of. Okay. So we we have um, our state reps behind it, and we have we have Eileen Dunning behind it. it. Must look pretty good for passage. Yeah, you know, as much as locally we have great support for right. it. Um, you know, I think it still faces a couple of challenges statewide. There are some. Uh, reps that maybe you know, uh, for whatever reason, may not uh, think it's in the best interest of everybody. But uh, you know, I think if we continue to push, sometimes it takes uh, more than one session to get it through. You just have to be, you know, uh, dedicated, and you have to be resilient to keep pushing it through. So, and Representative Mom has been great. How how is um, how does the police department react to uh, the Second Amendment? I've I've always wanted to ask the police chief that. Yeah. How, how, do, how do you react to the Second Amendment, um, um, the right to keep and bear arms? Well, what, you know, I think uh, well publicized uh, in the past year, year and a half or so, we actually uh, took a, a really detailed, significant look at that in the city. And so for 30 plus years here in the city of Lowell, uh, essentially they didn't give out uh, the unrestricted licenses to carry. That allows somebody to carry a weapon concealed hidden on their person right. uh, about the community, anywhere in the community. And so for 30 or more years, we didn't give them up, really, in this city. And it had been a long-standing policy. We were asked to review that. And, um, you know, we did take a look uh, along with the city law department, the lawyers that work for the city, and uh, we came up with a, a modification to the policy, a new policy, which does allow that. And uh, we, do, we asked for some additional training uh, for the individuals right. that, um, you know, were seeking to carry a concealed firearm. And uh, we did get the training and local vendors were uh, willing to step up and offer what we think is an appropriate training course for really very sharp money. And since that policy has been implemented about a year ago, um, we have probably issued about a hundred, or approaching a hundred I'd say now, modifications for individuals that have seek, uh, seek to go from the restricted license to carry, which is essentially allows very limited circumstances, mm -hmm. only uh, sporting or hunting right. to carry a firearm, to this uh, unrestricted. And so I think it has worked exactly as we uh, uh, hoped it would, allow more people that are properly trained in the community to uh, have a concealed um, permit that they previously would not have been able to get. The uh, Taft Hartley bill was, uh, as I recall, was was about uh, people carrying, um, well, basically illegally, um, and, and uh, they were supposed to get a, a year if they didn't have the the necessary paperwork from the police department. They were mm -hmm. supposed to get a year in prison. Yes. Do they actually? Does that actually happen? Or? It does, and I think there's a little bit of pe that people have to understand. Um, you know, if we in a police department arrest a thousand people, we don't go to trial on a thousand people. You know, the vast majority of those cases are adjudicated with some kind of a plea bargain, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is, based on the strength of the case uh, and the victim's or the suspect's willingness to accept some kind of punishment, there's a negotiation process, right? And so what happens? The same thing happens in these cases where, you know, if we have enough to charge somebody. But it's a very, very high burden in this country to convict somebody of a crime, right? Mm -hmm. Very high burden. Right. And so sometimes the evidence that we can present at a trial is maybe um, we're concerned that it wouldn't be enough, right? Because right. you have to get a, a conviction unanimous can, uh, a vote of a jury. So if we don't think that the, if we're concerned that the evidence might not survive um, that kind of a strict, very high standard, then we agree to a compromise. And right. so you see some cases of these gun cases, um, there's something less sometimes than a, uh, you know, a complete year, but that's that's dependent upon the strength of the case. How, how, how does the uh, 
How does the whole program of, of, of uh, not just school liaisons, but also neighborhood group liaisons with the police officer, with the police officer often coming to the neighborhood group and, and doing a presentation, how is all that working and, and, and uh, are, are you satisfied with it? I am. And so the way that we uh, do policing in this community, our focus uh, is to prevent crime, right? And we do that by problem solving and partnerships, right? So I kind of we call it the three P's. Right. Prevent crime by problem solving and partnerships fundamentally. And uh, a significant component of that is our neighborhood policing strategy where we have offices in the community working with the community group. And they also, each one of these uh, sectors, we call them, uh, the offices that work there have a dedicated civilian crime analyst, a, a civilian specialist mm -hmm. that really looks at data behind the scenes and works day in and day out with the offices that are assigned into these neighborhoods and the community groups to try and identify problems uh, and deal with them um, before they become the next crime generator, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we used as, uh, as a model for this program an incident that happened in Centerville several years ago where there was a uh, drug-related homicide, a shooting in the neighborhood. Then we went back after the fact and we tried, did a pretty in-depth analysis of what happened in that building, that neighborhood, that two, three block area. Mm -hmm. And when we went back and analyzed it, we saw the signs of decay uh, related to that whole situation that we didn't, that we missed quite candidly, right. right? And so we said to ourselves, how could we have found this and prevented this deterioration in, the, in this neighborhood and this ultimately led to a homicide? And so that's kind of how the program, you know, that's one of the, you know, things that we use to develop this program. And, it, and it's data, and we saw in that particular situation, we saw uh, prostitution activity, overdoses in the building, uh, complaints, things like that, um, that if we had been able to connect the dots using the data over several you know, months or whatever it might be, and taken the affirmative action by working with the city's inspectional services, uh, working with the landlord, uh, working with the neighborhood group in there, we the hope is and, and the theory is that if you you put positive you know things in place there, uh, you can prevent it from being a crime generator. And uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. That type well, of problem right. solving, you know, prevent it, the 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 focus is always on preventing crime, not dealing with preventative that. maintenance. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's more than that. It's preventing disorder is right. always better than dealing with the disorder after it happens, right? right. Common sense. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to focus on. We're not always successful, but that's the, that's the theory. Okay. Um, the uh, Penner protest, what is that, what, what do they hope to achieve in, in, in this protest? In, in, the the, the uh, city manager gave us 60 days, right? Oh, the discipline issue. Oh, discipline I didn't issue. know what you were talking about. Uh, I think it was actually 90 days. 90 days. Yeah. But I will short circuit you on that because yeah. that is currently the subject of, oh, that's a, of uh, uh, litigation and hearings, and so I'd rather oh, not, that's fine. not deal with that. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, I, I did want to mention to you, and I think I mentioned to you before, that. Uh, I live around St. Margaret's and, and uh, I see a lot of police presence in the area around St. Margaret's, so that, that's very comforting. Good. And uh, I, um, I did the, this, this didn't happen at all, but I, I, I got pulled over for a minor uh, violation, violation by a police officer, and he saw that I was shaking, mm -hmm. and he said, what have you been doing? And I said, I'm sorry, I have Parkinson's. And he says, "Oh, that's 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 fine." And so I, I, that that was my close scrape with the police. <laughs> well, that's good. So I it, that. It, uh, it it worked out well. It it seems to me that the police are working very hard to um, uh, not only to make the city safer, but to uh, in, increase the positive factors that 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 are generated in in the daily police work and. Uh, I have a 
an ex-daughter-in-law who's a police officer, and her husband's a police officer, so I know quite a bit about the poli policing part of it. And uh, what what is your official stance on um, on, on uh, police officers getting involved with the community? Oh, um, you know, look, fundamentally the way this has to work is the police and the community have to become one to provide effective public safety. We can't do it without the community. The community needs us uh, to work with them. So the way you do that is by building relationships, trust in each mm -hmm. other. And so it's essential that our police officers become ingrained in the community every chance they get, you know. And so what I hear constantly is people in the community want to see police officers walking, bicycling, segueing downtown. Uh, and that's where you provide the, that opportunity for a non-confrontational conversation about the Patriots game, the weather, whatever it might be. And that's how it starts, right? Mm -hmm. And so you build those relationships slowly, and then we get, you know, we break down the, the barriers that we all kind of have, right? We're going about our business a day, um, and, and that's how you do it. So it's essential that the police become ingrained in the game. They have to become ingrained, and they have to be reflective. And by reflective, I mean they have to, you know, mirror the demographic uh, makeup of, of this city or any city that you're going to police. So in other words, we're the local police. We're members of the community. We're us. And, um, and, and to, you know, build relationships is key. It's, it's really what it's all about. Because, we, you know, we still solve crime when we have to solve crime. We still solve crime the way it was solved, you know, 100, 200 years ago. People tell us who did the crime. Right. And the key component to that is trust, right? People have to trust us that we're going to help them, we're going to be there for them, and that we're going to, you know, do it professionally and, and um, you know, courteously. And so the way you do that is you build those relationships slowly over time. Well, the, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I think I'm pretty reflective of the, the entire uh, citizenship in that, uh, We've seen big changes in the <coughs> with the police department, and uh, it's 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 all been positive. Good, I'm glad to hear that. And you, they are, you know, the men and women of this organization are out there every day working very very hard. I think uh, you know we not that data is the end all be all. What's more important is how the people feel, right? Right. And and I think the fear of crime is significantly reduced. And then it makes it all the more important when you do have an unfortunate incident like happened the other day, right, right, right. that we effectively deal with that and we get in there and find out where that problem spot is and deal with it if, you know, effectively so we can, you know, make the community understand we're working in their interest. And you do have a program in place that uh, pays people for tips? We do. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Right. Uh, Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers. Yes, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we're on social media. Uh, get us on Twitter, get us on Facebook. We're even, I think we're on Instagram now. Well, so well, that's what it's all about now, getting the message out to the community and then hearing back. Right. All right. Okay. Well, I, I, I uh, have a boat on the low boat, at the Low Motor Boat Club, and uh, I really enjoy the police officers who, who are uh, on River Patrol. On, on River Patrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're great. Good. They're great, great, great people. Um, this is a uh, but Peter's, Peter's principles were with Chief Taylor, from <coughs> the Chief of Police for, for, for the City of Hull. And thank you, Chief, for thank being you. here. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate okay. it. Um, we really uh, enjoyed it, and it's been quite uh, enlightening.